This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him, And to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your word, that your word has been revealed to us, not in pictures, not in uh, some other form of communication, but in words that have been written down. And it is important then, uh, emphasizing the Uh, the specificity that this gives to your revelation, that it locks it down in terms of its meaning, in terms of its uh, communication. Father, we know that it is important to learn how to read, to learn how to read well, and to learn how to accurately interpret your word, not according to what we think, not according to our background or our assumptions, but according to uh, your intent. Now, Father, we come to your word today to focus upon what you've revealed, uh, continuing our study in Colossians related to the family, and specifically now that which would be an extended part of the family as it relates to uh, the master-slave relationship, which teaches us many things about our relationship as employees and as employers. Father, we pray that as we study this today that we might be humble and willing to submit our ideas and opinions to the teaching of your word, that God the Holy Spirit might use this transforming our thinking and our lives, that you might be glorified. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This last week, we did not have Bible class on Tuesday night because I was in Dallas, along with uh, several other people in the congregation, for the 22nd annual pre-tribulation Uh, Rapture Study Group Conference. For those of you who don't know, this is a uh, conference that was started uh, back in 1990 and was an outgrowth of several uh, conversations that had been going on between various uh, people within uh, dispensational theology, academics, professors, for the purpose of answering critics, but also shoring up what appeared to be uh, weaknesses, holes, uh, various uh, issues within our uh, pre-trib, dispensational, premillennial theology. And this has now been going on for 22 years. Each year focuses on different aspects, different issues. This year the focus was on apostasy. And I'm hoping that within the next couple of weeks, we will get all of the papers from this conference posted on the Dean Bible website so that you can download them and read them. And I encourage you to do that. As Bruce gets the videos edited, uh, we will make those available as well. Uh, The pre-trib group usually uh, distributes these at a price. This is one of the ways in which they raise Uh, money, funds for their organization, which is fine. That comes under the area of doubtful things as expressed by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But they have graciously, because we contribute personnel and resources to filming everything, they have said that that uh, that's available for anyone here to access. I encourage you to get this. This will open your eyes in many ways to streams of heresy that have uh, come out of the world, the culture around us, and have not only entered into uh, the church, uh, 
the world is too much a part of the church and the teaching of the church and the practice of the church today, but it will surprise you, it may offend you, it may tell you that things you are deeply devoted to are not only dead wrong, they are part of the doctrine of the Antichrist, and maybe you've been following the devil's disciples. It always amazes me as I study in these areas, and I've been doing this for uh, over 40 years now, that how people I don't really know, and in some cases people I do know who once were uh, very solid biblical expositors of the word, have gone way off the beam and are now, uh, have now dumped biblical Christianity. And one of, and the core doctrine that you see running through all of these different, uh, movements and trends that are going on today is the doctrine of the, it's the rejection of the doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture. That is really the core. I mean, even, either the Bible is 100% true, and God's grace is 100% sufficient, his power is 100% sufficient, and Christ's death is 100% sufficient, which is you don't need to look somewhere else to find additional information or help or aid with the issues of life. You need to learn how to trust God totally. We all do, and we all fail at that. But the issue isn't that doctrine somehow doesn't work or the Bible really doesn't handle this particular issue but that we're not willing to trust God. And uh, this runs through lots of different areas. And I would also, I think one of the great challenges, and this touch, touches to some degree on what we're looking at this, this morning, this also touches on the fact that you work, if you work for a, just about any company or corporation in, in, in this country, especially if you're involved in sales, I think to a large, to, to varying degrees, if you're within any kind of education, uh, any kind of, um, of, uh, of management in any company, the management theories, any, any, many psychological theories related to, uh, related to leadership, related to management, are heavily, heavily infiltrated by a lot of New Age ideas, a lot of uh, mystical ideas, a lot of ideas that are just a uh, counter to Christianity, but they're dressed up, they're sanitized. Terminology has been uh, changed in order to make it uh, acceptable and palatable to Western audiences. These things have been going on for 30 or 40 years. But in these pre some of these presentations, it just blows your mind once you start realizing some of the connections. Um, Ken Harnock, the, uh, well, the first presentation was uh, Tommy, Tommy's presentation on what the Bible teaches about apostasy and apostasy towards the end of the church age. That was followed by an excellent paper by uh, Doug Harnock who was uh, at Dallas roughly the same time that I was, or maybe it was Ken Harnock. I, they were like four brothers spanned to the 70s, and they all look alike. Never could, I couldn't keep them t separate when, I was, when we were all in school together, and I can't now. I think it was Ken. Ken did a great job, and he was a pastor for about 30-plus years in Utah. And he really inter spent a lot of time studying and interacting with Mormonism, which is heavily mystical. And he really, when you get out there and you deal with something like that, uh, in its native environment, so to speak, and you're living in the world system and you really understand those, those issues, and then you come out and you see the same thing, though it's been heavily diluted within the Christian church, your sensitivity to it and your ability to identify it is much more heightened than, uh, than it is otherwise. And so the person sitting next to you who's never been exposed to the really blackness of the dark side uh, doesn't necessarily see the little bit of grayness that's next to them until somebody starts to point them out. So Ken did an absolutely fabulous job in his presentation on mysticism. And then afterward, after lunch that first day, Paul Wilkinson, who has spoken, I think, the last four or five years, has his doctorate from, uh, I forget, the university in England. He's, uh, uh, he's a, a British... Uh, based uh, pastor, 
theologian. He's not, I don't think he serves as a pastor of his, of his church. He goes to a um, Pentecostal church over there. Their Pentecostal is a little different from ours. We just sort of step around that. He does great scholarly work, especially on Zionism and Israel and his presentation on the, the rise and increasing popularity of anti-Israelism, anti-Zionism, and anti-Christian Zionism that is uh, now growing rapidly within the evangelical church, bringing in people like uh, Rick Warren, who's very well known, who's a pastor of the Purpose Driven Monstrosity out in California, and Bill Hybels, who is also um, pastor of one of the ten largest churches up in uh, Willow Creek, uh, up in uh, up in the Chicago area, and these people influence thousands. I think there's over 750,000 churches who are part of an association with Rick Warren's purpose-driven monstrosity, and, uh, and I mean, there, and and many others. Brian McLaren with the emergent church mu- movement, and their influence on 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 mainstream Christianity is just enormous. And yet most pastors don't go to things like this. They don't hear these connections. They don't identify what's going on. So they need read somebody who read somebody who's influenced by Hybels or Warren or McLaren. And they, they, you have to recognize the ideas. So that, too, was a, just an excellent presentation. He analyzed this Christ at the church or Christ at the cross at the checkpoint. I always get that wrong. Christ at the checkpoint, this anti-Israel, anti-Zionist conference that occurred in um, in Bethlehem back in March of last year. And then uh, Mike Gendron did a, did a an analysis of uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, I'm not sure what happened on uh, Tuesday. Unfortunately, I got struck down by an <clears throat> abdominal virus. And so whatever happened on uh, Wednesday, it looked good, though. And uh, there was one paper given by, I think his name was Warren Smith, who came out of nowhere. I don't, he's a professor of history at uh, Colorado Christian University, and he is an expert on British 16th and, century, 16th and 17th century British thought. And he went back and spent most of two or three years reading original source material, sermons, writings, etc. Uh, of 16th, uh, uh, 17th, 18th century uh, British pastors and theologians and identified so many more pastors and theologians than we ever imagined who held to some form of a pre-trib rapture. This did not come on the scene with John Nelson Darby at the early 19th century, which is what uh, many people thought up until about 20 years ago, and is still what our critics claim is that this is some newfangled idea, but he's just done a masterful work on that. It's about a 50-page paper, but it's fascinating to uh, to read that. Uh, there were uh, some other, other papers that were presented on different aspects of... Uh, Tom McMahon, who works with Dave Hunt, did an excellent paper on the intrusion of, psych- of human transpersonal or interpersonal psychology into Christian thought, and then uh, also a paper on um, at, the, at the very end by Gary Gilley on this whole uh, thing of uh, spiritual formation groups, which has penetrated almost every every seminary except a few small ones, but all the larger ones have fallen prey to this. And what you find is how many people who are involved in one apostasy are also involved in the others and they, how they cross-pollinate ideas. So that was a, it was an excellent, uh, excellent conference, and I encourage you to uh, look at that material when, once we get it up on the Internet. One of the things that came out in the Q&A of uh, one of the uh, sessions had to do with uh, uh, how we can counter this because historical biblical orthodoxy, which is what this church affirms, our, our way in which we do church at West Houston Bible Church, is a, it's not traditional for the sake of being traditional, so I don't like using that word, but it is a historically consistent approach to, to church church. 
we focus on teaching the Word, teaching the Word, not just going out and grabbing a key phrase or idea and then zoning in on that and, and eliminating everything else, which is part of uh, modern views of meditation, which adopts a sort of a, a kind of interpretive, interpretation that, that, that takes the, the, uh, a passage, I mean, not even a passage, a, a phrase, a clause, even a word, completely out of context, and then you, you just make it mean whatever you, you want it to mean. This is, this is not... Uh, the, on the foundation of historic Protestant interpretation. We believe in a literal, consistent hermeneutic, which means that we believe the interpreting the, every word on the basis of its normal usage and how it was used historically uh, and in the context of, of the Bible. And so it's, there's an emphasis there on reading. And one of the men who asked a uh, question, came up in the Q&A, has been involved in some new form of, uh, of training for teaching children reading. It's not phonics, it's not, it's, but it's a kind of a different way, which has a lot of positive things to it. But in the discussion that came out of it, uh, one other pastor commented on the, how difficult it is within the home to find uh, parents and fathers who really understand how to implement their key role in the home with their children. And this is what I've talked about the last two or three weeks, and I wanted to just touch on that before we get into our passage this morning. Because this pastor pointed out that he has found it necessary, and I always get surprised at this, but the inability of the people from products of the American culture to put A and B together and come up with C never ceases to amaze me. I hope this doesn't apply to most of you, but he found that it applies in his church. He has to go into the home with his children and act and show how he reads Bible stories to his children and how he teaches the Bible to his children because if he just outlines it from the pulpit, the men go home in a daze and have no clue how to actually do what it is that he has been teaching. And if we're going to see any kind of impact in our culture and on our families, it's going to begin in the home. It's going to begin with the fathers who take their God-given responsibility seriously. And for many of you, it may be as grandfathers to take that, that responsibility seriously and to implement change in the way the culture of your family operates so that you take that position, that biblically responsible position to start teaching, training, modeling, uh, biblical thinking for, for your family. The earlier you can start, the better. If you have small children, one of the great things that you can do as a parent is to read stories aloud to your children, even up into the time that they're in second, third, or fourth grade. It's time spent together. Take Bible stories. There's a number of different children's Bible stories. I had uh, uh, Sandy bring a few things up here. You can get uh, small books like this that are just that are geared for different age levels that are just uh, story specific. Or you can also find, um, there's a number of books. This is one on Noah and the Ark. Uh, this is not an ICR publication, but there are uh, many ICR publications geared for children. Here's another book that is uh, just stories from the Bible. And just read the stories to your kids. Show them the pictures. Kids are very visual or their various uh, Bible story books. I, I remember until I, you know, took it away from my mother and read it for myself, that my mother would read to me from uh, Hurlbut's story of the Bible, which was an old classic. But there's a lot of different good books like this, and I encourage you, if you are a father or a grandfather, your mandate from Scripture is to train up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It's not your wife's job. It's not somebody else's job. It's not the school's job or prep school's job. It's your job. And I encourage you to make a difference by taking that time. You, every night before they go to bed, go in, read with them, pray with them. Don't pray a prayer like, now I lay me down to sleep, some pre-written prayer, but Pray conversationally to God with them. 
Give them an opportunity to pray, even if it's just a phrase, a couple of sentences, things like that. This is very important, and it's important for them to see you as a male leader emphasizing and focusing on uh, spiritual things and your relationship with the Lord. This is, as we've seen, very important. The Apostle Paul addresses the whole issue of structure and the emphasis on the Word within the family, as we've seen in Colossians chapter uh, 3. Uh, we're in verses uh, actually 20, uh, today, 22 down to 4 1. And in Ephesians, this is paralleled in Ephesians 6 1 through 4. In this section, we're shifting to the relationship between the master and the servant. Now, this is a slave, actually, the term doulos. We often water down in our anti-slavery Western uh, post-19th century mentality. But doulos had as its primary meaning in the Roman Empire, slave. And with all the negatives that were involved with that, a doulos was a slave. We often soften that today because of our position, historic position of anti-slavery and because there's not as much slavery around, so we want to use terms like, like servant. Bond slave softens it a little bit, or servant. These are roles and that are, um, are voluntary. A servant is someone who is voluntarily entered into service. But a doulos was a slave. It was an involuntary relationship. And often and frequently, the master did not have the uh, best interest of the slave at heart when he uh, governed the slave's uh, life. And he did things to whatever was the master's best interest. The slave, on the other hand, may be focusing on doing what's best for them. And so there could be a conflict set up just as you could have conflicts in any other human relationship. And it always boils down to what one person wants for themselves versus what the other person wants for themselves. At the core of almost any, any conflict, you have one person's I wants versus the other person's I wants. It always, conflict, extended conflict, always boils down to arrogance and self-absorption. Now, in this passage... I'm just going to read it quickly. The first four verses relate to the uh, mentality of the bond servant, the slave, and the last addresses the master. Bond servants or slaves, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, the parallel passage in Ephesians is very similar, adding a few clauses, but I want to read through it as well. You'll see a few differences. But it again addresses the slave. Slave, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, adding with fear and trembling. This is related to the fact of the emphasizing the importance of that authority orientation. In sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ. Now that's a new thought that's added in Ephesians. It's not in Colossians. But the point he's making is slaves obey your masters because you're a slave to Christ and he's the one you're really serving. The human master is only the immediate or intermediate position. You're really serving Christ. It doesn't matter who the physical master is, good or bad. The issue is whatever you're position, you're ultimately serving Christ. That's the framework for our mentality. Now, see, that's not any different from what he said as he's addressed uh, children's obedience to parents or wives' obedience to husbands. It always comes back to the fact that all authority relationships are ultimately a reflection of our understanding of our submission, our authority position in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that mentality, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 6, 7, with good will, doing services to the Lord and not to men, because we know that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. So let's just uh, look at the passage. I want to point out a couple of things just in terms of translation. I've already pointed out that it should be understood to be slaves and not just softened as bond servants. Second thing we should note is that there's a gnomic or universal principle stated in verses uh, 23 and 24. This is a universal principle that applies to anything in life, but it's but Paul is taking this and applying it specifically to that relationship of the employee to the employer. We can make that application here, or the uh, slave to the master. Whatever you do, whatever involves anything that you are doing for your master, whether it's drudgery, whether it's something you don't want to do, something you dislike doing, uh, whatever it is, do it heartily uh, as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward. Now, it's interesting how Paul introduces this terminology of reward in verse 24 and the uh, payment in verse 25. He who does wrong will be repaid. This is language that is uh, used in uh, work-related, labor-related language, a payment for a uh, task that has been performed. But the reward, the payment, is not in time, it is in eternity. So we're not doing this for immediate gratification, but recognizing that eventually, even if the circumstances involve injustice, there will be a setting of things right eventually, and this will be, we know, at the judgment seat of Christ. Another thing I wanted to point out about Colossians 3, uh, uh, is it there or in um, yeah, Colossians 3 uh, that we are to uh, serve Christ? Uh, Colossians 3.24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Now look at how that's translated there at the end. For you serve the Lord Christ. Now, there's no for in the Greek. In fact, it's translated both in New King James and New American Standard and probably other translations as if that verb serve is an indicative mood, which is you serve the Lord and remember you serve the Lord. I think one translation translates it that way. Actually, it's an imperative. It's a concluding statement, and it just stops, at the, the sentence stops, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, period. Serve the Lord Christ. That's the idea, is that in whatever position we're in, this applies, of course, uh, in immediate context to a uh, master-slave relationship, but uh, even though that's involuntary, principles here also apply to the voluntary relationship that we have in our work. And all of us work for somebody. Even CEOs work for their stockholders. So everybody is under some kind of authority. And this is emphasizing the fact that the ultimate authority we're all accountable to is the Lord Jesus Christ. In this first verse, it's addressed to the slaves. Slaves, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. That phrase, according to the flesh, is used in both Colossians and Ephesians, and it's emphasizing the fact that this is talking about the earthly master as opposed to the heavenly master. The word flesh sometimes has a negative meaning in relation to the sin nature, but here it is used in a way, as it is often in Scripture, just to refer to physical mortal existence. So the the slave is addressed here, and is commanded to obey. But a couple of things we should note is, first of all, it's highly significant that Paul addresses slaves. Because in Greco-Roman culture, slaves were non-entities. Nobody would address a slave. This shows a radical departure from uh, the cultural norm. Paul is not writing this because he's influenced by cultural ideas. I say that once again to counter the idea that's often used in, in, the, in the first command related to wives submitting to your husbands, 
uh, usually you'll hear people say, well, see, Paul was just this uh, uh, chauvinist, he was a uh, misogynist, and, and he didn't like women, and so he's always telling them to submit. But he turns around and gives commands to the husband as well, which never would have happened. And women were almost as much a non-entity in Greco-Roman culture as slaves were. The fact that Paul addresses them shows that he's elevating to a st- them to the same status of significance as masters and as husbands. And that's revolutionary. So he addresses the slave here, first of all. And he's saying that he treats them as responsible people. They have volition. And in their position, even though they may not be uh, in a... Uh, a position where they are free to leave, they are free to choose how they will function and what their mental attitude will be as a slave, no matter how bad the circumstances will be. Their mental attitude as a Christian slave is not to be determined by the negatives of their circumstances and their environment. Because if they are where they are, God has placed them there, And they are there to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in that environment. They're not there to work for their human master. That's only the circumstantial reality. They are there to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to do the best job they possibly can as a reflection of their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he addresses them as slaves. He addresses both the slave and the master. And then the last thing I want to point out is in addressing them as slaves, he's not endorsing the institution of slavery, although the institution of slavery, as it was outlined in the Mosaic Law, is more akin to what we would call indentured servitude. The way slavery operated in the Roman Empire was not as it did as chattel slavery in the United States in the 19th century. But this is neither an endorsement or an approval of or rejection of slavery. I think it's important that he doesn't address that. And that is not because as Christians it shouldn't be addressed. But I think that it shows that as an apostle, he has a mission. And the mission is not to address social change. That's not the primary mission of of Christianity. But when Christian principles are applied then it will result in social change. That's what happened as Christian principles were applied to the institution of slavery in the early 19th century under the leadership of men like William Wilberforce and Granville Sharp, who was a noted Greek uh, New Testament scholar. And as they applied principles, uh, Christian principles to the institution of slavery, it led to the uh, outlawing of the international slave trade and eventually to uh, ending uh, slavery in both England and the United States. And often you will hear people who are of shallow minds and simple philosophies who want to say, well, you know, it's all you Westerners who were enslaving uh, black Africans. The reality is, number one, it was the Arab Muslims who were the uh, middlemen who were uh, taking Uh, uh, the consequences of black-on-black, African-on-African violence in Africa, and the losers were then sold by the victorious tribe to the Arab slave traders, who then sold them to uh, the the Europeans. So the issue, the the blame, the responsibility for this slavery uh, does not lie upon Western Europeans. And the other thing we should note is that it is the influence of Christianity and only the influence of Christianity on uh, slavery that led to the end of slavery. Now, Paul isn't addressing that issue because that's a secondary issue. It's not related to his primary mission as an apostle. So he says, uh, slaves, obey in all things your masters. The word for obey is that idea to listen, to obey, to put into practice uh, something, and it's to obey in all things. Now, somebody says, well, is that everything? Well, if you study the context of Scripture, it does not mean that you obey your master or anyone in authority who tells you to do something that is contrary to the direct command of God. If God directly tells us to do something in the Scripture, 
Not something you think he, you should do, not an application of a principle, but a direct uh, prohibition or a direct mandate in Scripture. If somebody in authority tells you to violate that, then we are to follow the principle of Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, and we obey God rather than man. But other than that, we are to obey our masters, and if they tell us to do things that we find unpleasant or distasteful, then we do it to the best of our ability. Uh, years ago, I, I um, had an opportunity to sit down with John Walbert, who was the president of, of Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, Dr. Walbert and I were discussing a, in, an individual um, situation where uh, there had been some rather negative press about this particular pastor, and, um, and it really wasn't true. And, and Dr. Walbert had unfortunately believed some of, these, uh, some of this bad press, and, and he asked me uh, as I was up there, he said, what are you doing these days? And I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm down in Houston working for an old friend of yours named Bob Thiem, and uh, kind of raised his eyebrow, and he said, uh, said I, I, he said, you know, Bob was, uh, was a great student, and he was, and he said, um, he said his wife, Betty, was the best secretary I ever had. A lot of people don't know what a close relationship Pastor Thiem had with Dr. Walvert when he was a, when he was a student. Of course, they were all much, much younger, and this was in the early 40s. Uh, Pastor Theme started Dallas Seminary bef- for one semester before World War II and then went back to finish afterward. But uh, Dr. Walvoord made a comment. He said, you know, there was one thing. He said, Bob Theme was the best elder I ever had at that time. Uh, Dr. Walvoord was a pastor of what I believe was Northwest Presbyterian Church in Fort Worth, and it was had an elder form of government. And Pastor Theme is a student when he was in the military, when he was in the Air Force Station, I think that's Carswell Air Force Base, is that right, up in um, Fort Worth, was, um, was stationed there, was an elder at uh, Dr. Walvoord's church. And uh, Dr. Walvoord said, you know, I, I, I has had Bob do all kinds of things that I knew he hated to do, but I knew that they would be done right, that no matter what I asked him to do, no matter how distasteful he found it, no matter how much he disagreed with doing it, no one would do a better job of it than he would. And I thought, wow, that is really high praise for someone. And that is how we should all be, is that whatever we do when we are serving an employer, that doesn't mean that we're just sort of a pushover. If they ask us to do something, we don't think it's wise or good or something else. We can raise an objection, say, why don't we do it this way, figure out how to use one of Daniel's strategies to appeal to the uh, a person in authority. But the bottom line is, when we do the job, whatever it is, it needs to be done better than anyone else would do it. And that is what, uh, what relates to our personal testimony. We're to obey in all things, masters, not with eye service. Don't just do it so it looks right. There are a lot of people who all of a sudden when they're being observed, when they're being watched, they perform well. But once the uh, supervisor's out of the way, they go back to slovenly ways. But this is not done with eye service as men pleasers. In other words, you're not there to please some human authority or someone in, 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 in supervisory position. But in sincerity of heart, and then the participle there that's translated fearing God is a participle of result, it means, and it's really tied to obey, obey as a result of fearing God. Our obedience to the authority in our life, whatever that authority is, but in context here it's, it's the master, is as a result of our respect and our fear for the Lord. The word translated obey is the same word that's used over in Philippians 2.8, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the incarnation, which, we met, which I focused on as we observed the Lord's table, that as he entered into human history, that's described in verses 5 through 7 of Philippians 2. I won't go through that for the sake of time. But as he became a man, verse 8 says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. See, your or my level of obedience to authority is directly related to our humility. Humility is the opposite of arrogance. When we're arrogant and we're self-absorbed and we're focusing on what we think is best and what we think is right, 
then, then we can't be humble. We can't be obedient. We're going to be reactionary and we're going to be disobedient. So the Lord Jesus Christ modeled this for us. And that's important because no one suffered a greater injustice than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many of us focus on what we think are injustices. Oh, poor me. I've been mistreated. My boss doesn't understand me. Or th- this, this company just doesn't take care of its workers. Or whatever the circumstance is, it's ir- irrelevant in terms of, of uh, its seriousness when you compare it to the true injustice of the capital punishment on the Lord Jesus Christ when he was without sin. And yet he humbled himself. He didn't make an issue out of his innocence, which he could have. He could have wiped out uh, with just a, a blast of his nostrils. He could have wiped out the entire Roman army in uh, Judea. But he didn't. He humbled himself to the plan of God and became obedient to the point of death. It's learning to be obedient. Hebrews 5 8 says, Though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. See, we go through injustice so that we can learn to be obedient to the authorities around us, from God to the human authorities. 1 Peter 2 18 emphasizes these same principles. Peter says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. That idea of respect, but it's more than just respect, it is a fearful respect not only to the good and gentle, in other words, not only to those who take care of you and treat you well, but also to the harsh, those who don't have your best interests in mind, those who abuse you, those who mistreat you. And then Peter says, this is commendable. It's commendable when you're in a situation where you are overlooked, when you're not valued, when you don't get treated the way you think you ought to be treated, and yet you handle it with grace and dignity, this is commendable. And he says, For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God one endures grief and suffers wrongfully. Now that kind of goes against what a lot of people think. I'm not going to suffer wrongfully. Why should I suffer wrongfully? I want, I want what's due me. I mean, that's at the very core of unions. A lot of talk about unions in the uh, news today. And I think historically there were some valid reasons for unions. But and that, that it was a reaction to the fact that there were masters, owners, who violated grace principles as outlined here in the, in the, in the Scripture. But one wrong... Does, uh, does not make another, two wrongs don't make a right. When one wrong is committed, doesn't give us the right or justification to commit another wrong. Peter says, if for its conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? Well, you know you deserve it. But when you do good and suffer, so when you do the right thing and you're beaten, um, if you take it patiently, that is commendable before God. And then he compares that to Christ. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So Christ is the pattern again for Peter, just as he is for Paul. So we serve the Lord. Now we get into the last part of the verse. It's not with uh, eye service, not for uh, superficial reasons, but in sincerity of heart. A- act Actually, this is, that's more of a literal translation. The idiom means with integrity. This is where you have integrity is serving. Even when nobody's looking, are you giving it the best you can give? And then verse 23 says, whatever you do, do it heartily. That word heartily literally means from the soul. It comes from who you are, from your character, from your belief system, from your focus upon the Lord. You do it from the soul, from your Uh, inner strength, your inner focus, uh, as to the Lord and not to men. doesn't matter what people think. It matters what the Lord thinks, and he's got a higher standard than most of the people we know. Colossians 3.24 starts with a causal participle that should be translated, because you know something. This is what enables us to do this. We know that from the Lord we will receive the reward of the inheritance. In other words, if you're walking by the Spirit and you're doing well, even if it's overlooked, then that accrues to gold, silver, and precious stones and our inheritance at the judgment seat of Christ. 
Why? Because in your job, in my job, whatever we do, we're serving the Lord. Not just if you're a pastor, a missionary, some sort of spiritual function, but if you are working in any field, whether you're a doctor, whether you're in sales, whether you're in management, whatever it is, the person you're really serving is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the final statement. It's, it's just simply a command there. Serve the Lord Christ. Not for you serve. No explanation there. Just serve the Lord Christ. And then uh, in conclusion he says, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. Not in time necessarily, but at the judgment seat of Christ. For there's no partiality, and that is with God. And then one verse related to masters and applied to employers or to upper-level management. Give your slaves, that is, those who are working under you, what is just and fair. I don't like that word fair. Fair is a term that means too many different things to too many different people. The two Greek words that are used here, the word just, means that which conforms to a righteous standard, to an absolute standard. And the word translated fair has to do with, with integrity the, uh, or equality so that all, all the slaves are treated the same way according to the same standard. There's not a preference given to one over another, but there is a consistency toward each and every one. Not that there's some... Uh, standard of fairness that we're going to try to make everybody the same, but they're all going to be treated according to the same standard, a standard of governing their their life and their work, not governing their results. The principle throughout that we've seen throughout this entire study is that in our life as Christians, we serve the Lord. If you're a wife, you're to submit to your husband, not because he's a great guy, but because you're serving the Lord. Husbands, you love your wife, but the pattern isn't because she's so adorable, uh, she may be, but it's because of the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved us even when we were obnoxious to him. As children, children are to obey their parents because it's right. And fathers are not to provoke their children to anger. They are to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bond servants, same principle. Obey your your earthly master because you're really serving the Lord. At the core of all these mandates is our relationship to God. If we don't understand and properly function within the realm of authority, especially when it runs against what we want, If we can't understand how to be obedient to authority in that earthly realm, it says something not too good about how well we're obedient to the Lord. There's a direct correlation. And the pattern is always based on our submission to the authority of God. And why is that important? Because that was the core issue in the angelic conflict. Next time, we'll come back next week, and believe it or not, we'll wrap up. Uh, Colossians. Not a lot left. Most of what's left in chapter 4 are final greetings and salutations, but there's a few wrapping up principles that we need to cover, and that will conclude our study in Colossians. And then the following Sunday is the Sunday before Christmas, and we'll focus on uh, the story of the incarnation at that point before we start a new study on Sunday morning after Christmas with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word this morning and to be reminded of our uh, position as those who are under authority as well as perhaps in authority. All of us are in positions of authority in one field or another, and we are all under authority, but ultimately we're all under your authority. We pray that we might learn to be truly submissive to you because that is the ultimate issue, that we submit ourselves to you as the... Uh, sovereign God of the universe, our creator, and the one who provided us with a perfect salvation. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty for you in your place because it's a penalty that we cannot pay on our own. Father, we pray that... uh, 
that we might clearly understand what it means that Christ died for us so that he did all the work and it's not something dependent upon us. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, this is your opportunity to do so. Right where you are, right where you sit, if you trust, if you believe Jesus died for you, then you have eternal life. It can never be taken from you, and and it is yours throughout all of eternity. The instant of faith in Christ, you have eternal life, and you're in the royal family of God, and you have a new standard, a new life code, and that is what you need to learn about as we study the Word. Father, we pray that you would challenge us with the things we studied here. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.